Hello, this is Janet Gallen with another episode of Love Letters Live. And today's is going to be really interesting. And it happens that I have invited a woman I was friends with. Well, let me just say Kimberly Blattner is the, um, you're the president of the Valley of the Moon Music Festival. Is that correct? President of the board, yes. Pardon me? President of the board. Oh, president of the board. Yeah, I, I did a shortcut, right? Thank yes. you for that. Thank yes. you for that. So the question, at first, I just want to say how glad I am that we were connected. You know, we were friendly ages ago because we met at a party. And when I discovered that your husband, Simon, made paper, well, that just stole my heart. Yes. And then, yes. you know, life sometimes just takes people apart from each other, not for I lack think, of I think person. it's been 15 years since we've reconnected. So yes. it's you know, just separate waves. And I'm so glad yes. when I discovered that you were doing this, I thought this is going to be a wonderful love letter to somebody. Oh, fantastic. So Good. how did you, when, when you were growing up, were you raised with a lot of music? What was your upbringing like? Well, it, it's interesting in terms of my interest in music, in classical music now, no classical music uh, in my family at all. And I always was very sad that we didn't have the means for any of us to take any uh, lessons on uh -huh. instruments. So I've never learned to play music, which is one of the reasons why the history of music is so fascinating to me is because that's a place that I could, I could go to on my own. So that, uh, that I, the interest, the history of music grabs you early? Oh, absolutely. I was a, a very, I was a, a, a child who uh, hibernated in my room and read uh, history from, for hours and hours and hours. Really? And, uh, yes. Start, uh, for what, some reason, what, what kind of history primarily did you grab? It towards? started with um, uh, Egypt for some reason. And I, so I've always been fascinated with history and archaeology anthropology that was always always my passion but to say about uh, uh music in the family we did have a musical family in the sense that my father was uh, scottish and my father was a bag bagpipe oh, player oh and, oh goodbye and, my and, husband. I love bagpipes oh it's fantastic and i'm so upset he, oh, okay oh, go it's ahead. fantastic and he played um he was the um I forget what the name is, the leader, the leader of his band, essentially. And so he taught bagpipe lessons in our front living room my oh. whole childhood. And so I was always listening to him. What a lot of people don't realize is when you play the bagpipes, you play essentially on a small, like a flute, uh, for many years before you ever get to the blowing of the pipes, because that's the easy part. The, the more difficult part is learning to play the, what's called the canter which is the finger, the finger motion. Oh, yes. Yeah. And would so um, while he did that, I had was raised in a family of five sisters. There were six girls and mm -hmm. we were all Scottish dancers. Oh, that too. Okay. Yes. So I had a dancing background, but never playing an instrument, which I, as I became older, I, I, I still lust with the idea of maybe someday I'll take piano lessons. Or, or bagpipe. Or, <laughs> I, I don't think so in terms of the wind, but yes. Oh, no, I, no, I, yeah. I don't. So, so tell me about your Scottish dancing. Uh, well, I probably started when I was mm, six and I uh, Scottish danced and I was in a, a lot of competitions. And uh, also my father, uh, because he had this large, it was called the Clan McClay uh, bag, Bagpipe Band, uh, marched in a lot of parades. So I was in a lot of uh, parades as a dancer, as a young child. What a privileged upbringing! I must. Oh, it, say. it was it was fantastic, and I've actually listened to some of your other um, podcasts, and you talk about uh, privilege. And my privilege was not at all in money. We didn't have that, but my my story has always been that I was uh, born on third base because I was born white in the United States to highly educated parents. So you you know if if you can't succeed somewhere with that, then something's wrong. Oh my goodness. I'm just, for one of the very few times in my life, I'm kind of speechless. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. But so, so then in terms of classical music, what ended up happening is that when I was in high school, I, my boyfriend's mother was the president of the uh, Portland Symphony. And I was what? raised in uh, Portland Symphony in Portland, Oregon, where uh -huh. I was raised. So uh -huh. as our dates, we went to every symphony performance. 
Oh, so you did get a lot of music in your life. When I was a junior in high school, that's what happened. I fell in love with classical music. And my family all thought I was <laughs> kind of nuts because I used all the money that I saved to buy um, uh, albums of classical music. And then I took, took all of those to college and I played classical music all of my life. Okay. We, we, we're like two peas in the same pod. More on this when we're just private because this yes, is... I, I, I so don't... do you remember the first piece of classical music that you ever heard that grabbed you? Oh, I'm sure it was Beethoven's Fifth. That was probably, you know, it's kind of the classic one that's played often. So, uh, yes, that's the first one. And then I then I then I later uh, moved towards uh, Bach uh, concertos, which which I love and still listen to. And I have uh, the classical masterpieces on my radio all the time here. Oh, that's, yes. Yeah. That's you have serious radio. Exactly. Yes. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 949, I think. <laughs> you know, it is such a miraculous life. Yes. And and when you think, I mean, there's so many different kinds of music. I don't know if you've ever heard Hawaiian Aboriginal music. I have a little bit because in college, my uh, roommate uh, was from um, Maui, from Honolulu. And um, so I, um, not Maui, yeah. And um, so I actually went over and visited her a number of times and we went and visited some uh, uh, ethnic music halls. Yes, I mean, it's just... Every well, okay. So the importance of music. Let's talk about that. But did you happen to see? I saw it because everybody was seeing it, and I was curious. I think it was called mm, the White Lotus. I don't. Was it a film? It a TV series. No, I didn't see that. Well, I think that's what it was called. But the entire first year, you know, the first set had Hawaiian music. You got to go look at this. Oh, I'll it go. Look at is, it. you know, I was. I, I couldn't wait to get to the next episode to hear the introductory music. And I kept playing. There's so much exquisite music. What does it do for us as a society? Why do oh, we? It, it, it unites us. It opens us up. So the, one of the things you could see, you could probably get every right wing person and every left wing person into a concert hall and suddenly their hearts all explode together. And it doesn't have to be classical music. Usually I see it in rock bands. You get together and then suddenly you're all jiving and you're all there together and you could dance and uh, your differences, um, they don't come up. So I think of it as a an opening of the heart and a, and a unification. Because it does speak for us in a way that nothing else does. That's exactly right. And it's not words that can alienate you or that can sharp, draw a, a sharp response. Although, although music has been a battleground. It has been in the Look past. Look at the things that Mozart did. And, I mean, he was just about run out of Beethoven. Yes, Yes, but also you know, it was a, a battleground because that was the primary form of entertainment. And I think, well, no, actually, even when you think now there's a little bit of a battleground between are you a country, uh, you know, advocate or are you a classical music advocate? Well, OK, but there's, a, there's a lot of but I, I just did want to say about the battleground, I think for the people who are really the border busters and did things suddenly differently, wasn't it Mozart used um, did something with ballet and. And he was, when they go against the established grain, yes, they're yes. treated very harshly. I mean, yes. Elvis Presley, for example. Oh, exactly, exactly. They are treated for, but then and then it takes a period of time, and then be, they become celebrated as revolutionaries. Right, so which, right. Which but you know, I know I noticed with Elvis Presley, he was just he was just considered too sexy for the time, and it was terrifying for people. Yes. Well, because the, oh, because music carries a power with it that will drag people along. Yes. Yes. It, it, well, it has that emotional power, and of course, what comes from emotion is sexual activity. So, <laughs> right. right. Without a doubt. So, but my my transformation into actual working for classical music was uh -huh. I am a very I am a, a strong feminist. So when I when I'm inter it's interesting to me that my classical music was driven by two men. One, my high school boyfriend, and then um, my uh, my husband, Simon. When I met him, uh -huh. he was on the board of the Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra in San Francisco. I had no so idea. Just, just like in high school, when I went to every symphony, I started going to every single concert. And then when he went off the board, I went on the board. So I was on the board in San Francisco, the Philharmonia, for about eight years. Mm -hmm. And that started my passion about early classical music. 
And then when I met Tanya and Eric, I was exposed, which is for the Valley of the Moon Music Festival, I was exposed to the whole concept of playing on original historic instruments, which okay. I, I had no knowledge of at all. Talk, talk about some of them. Now, is that the main thrust of the Valley of the Moon? That is, that <laughs> is, that's that is, the, absolute, that is the absolute basic thrust, main thrust of the festival. I did not so, know that. Yes. So that is, so they play on instruments from which the composers composed for. Right. So when, what is, we have, uh, why I love it is I was a, an educator. I taught high school for 18 years. So history and education is, uh, I'm passionate. But you taught, about. you taught history? I, I first taught a history in American government. And then the last eight years that I taught, I taught, um, English and uh, theater at our local high school, Sonoma Valley High School. That's a whole other aspect of you. You just do go on in many ways, don't oh, you? Oh, you just go all over the place. Yes, yes. Um, so so give us, can you oh, give, so us an, give us an example? Tell us about some of the original ancient instruments. Well, so for example. How um, do you get them? Well, that's one of the things. A lot of them are in, mu in museums. A lot of them people literally have found uh, in their in their addicts that they realize, oh, oh my, my grandfather had this old fiddle. And the big difference is that the, the strings are gut strings right. rather than steel. And so they, um, they, you know, they, 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 have a, they have a deeper, deeper kind of sound and, and resonance. And, um, and then for the piano, they played on a forte piano, which is called- How do you get piano. one of those? Well, some people have them in museums and they're old, but now because there is a, a rev not a revolution, but a uh, re, re excitement about old playing on old historic instruments, some uh, people are now making old forte piano. Oh, really? But the, the key is, is to find an original and then, and mm -hmm. then uh, deal with it, which is exactly what we do. Our um, artistic director, Eric Zivian, plays on a forte piano, and I think he probably owns three. And so, but the big issue about them is they are very, very, not temperamental, but, you know, they're very sensitive and they have to be tuned constantly. So if you are in an outdoor performance, you have to spend, you know, hours tuning them before you can perform because- And all, and all your performances are summer and outdoors? Yes. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So- how do, Okay, uh, so just to let people know, just to take a minute, yes. how do we get tickets? How do we, if we're going to be in the area- you're going to go on the Valley of the Moon Music Festival website and you can mm -hmm. get tickets tickets right there. It's the last two weeks in July. And uh, this year um, it is um, basically, a, it's called Transformation and it's taking large classical concerts. I heard about, I was going to ask you about that. Down to small chamber music. Who does that? Who does the re- uh, Tanya and Eric, who are our artistic directors, but there are also lots of composers. So they do the rescoring? It, yes. And there are lots of composers who actually did that themselves. I mean, Beethoven wrote huge concerts and then they scored them down for small, so small kinds of co uh, concerts so that they could play their large compositions in private homes. Right. They'd right. go around because a lot of people couldn't afford to get out to large, to large concerts and that kind of thing. So what I love, love about this um, uh, program or the, the festival is that a major component that we have of it is not just a historical or instruments, but that we introduce new young apprentices into playing on, the on, old, on the old instruments. On old instruments. So we bring in, it's called our apprentice program. And now since we're in our ninth year, we have literally, oh, I don't know, 50 people who apply for our four, four positions because wow. it's become so well known. To, first of all, to come to Sonoma Valley and, and to stay in private homes and do all of that, it's, it's lovely. But is that part of the Blattner Lecture Series? No, no, that's separate. That's separate. Okay, we'll these, get to these, that. Okay. These, these are musicians. And so the musicians, they come and they're generally, they're about to graduate from Juilliard and they're, they're about to go into a major concert hall and they come out and they are playing a Bach concerto, which they've been playing probably for 12 years for the first time in their lives on the instrument that Bach was playing. So it's the first time that they hear it the way the composer heard it. Oh, I just, and, I'm going to, I'm going to cry. Oh, and it is, it is just revelatory for them. And all of them say that it changes their life and their perspective of music. Oh my goodness. I'm sure it does. It's changing mine. Just listening to you. Yes. So it, it. It, I mean, it's just, it's just really, really lovely. Really and, moving and powerful. What yes. about the lecture series? 
Well, the lecture series is something that um, Simon and I, again, it's, it's kind of my, both of our loves of, of history and of a way I just keep thinking about how do we make classical music not a white elitist experience? And how do we also bring in people like myself who don't have really a real musical background? So I, if you told me, describe a chord, or if you get into, into the intricacies of the playing the music, and I, I, the language is lost on me. I don't know it. I've never studied it. So I wanted to be able to have other people be able to come and experience a language that they could understand. So just to be that much more expansive. So we decided to bring in a lecture series. And so in other words, you take complicated music theory kind of things and put it into language that people can understand? Yes, or it really depends on who the lecturer is who comes. If the lecturer comes and uh, say, say we in uh, we are about to hear a, a Mozart, and if mm -hmm. he is a Mozart expert, he could say, okay, let's talk about what happened, what was going on in Mozart's life while he was composing this particular thing, and why did he change the music from what had been the way it was before? What was going on, and what was he experimenting with? So there's a whole. You could just sit there and uh, have a sense of appreciation and know that you are uh, wise enough <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to listen to the production, which is really great. Mm -hmm. So it's, it can be history, it can be an analysis of the music, it can oh, be uh, whatever really the lecturer wants. And they also, the lecturers now love to come to Sonoma Valley and do I'm this. I'm sure. So you we know, have- Anytime people who are expert at something or feel passionate about something can find a like-minded audience that's right. That's what right. What a joy that is. Yeah. So right. also, so there's the education component of it. And then there is the education component of it at for children. And that we want to be able to make sure that uh, children have this exposure. So, uh, and again, we don't want it to be expensive. So we, every year we have a free children's concert. Nice. And um, it's a little tricky because we want to make sure that we get a broad, we want to get the Latino community here, right. but it's at the community center and um, it's in the backyard and they have, um, which you'll see, I, I sent you the picture of my granddaughter. After the performances, all the children can come up to the, the cellist and the violinist and, and talk to them and pluck at their instruments. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, it's kind of, a, you, you learn by touching for sure. Yes. You learn by activity. And being up close, you know, I, I mean, when my, when my older daughter was two, we had chamber music concerts at home. And one of the evenings was a very celebrated cellist. And after the whole evening, it was like midnight, this two-year-old wanders up to the cello and stares at it, at which point she played Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh, <gasps> wow. And got a lifetime. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, it just but but the intimacy. Yes. That you're you're saying it's it's accessible for and you can't start too soon. No, you can't start too soon at all. Too soon at all. So already with my my grandchildren, as, as I said, I have classical music playing all the time. And uh, they've taken dance classes, but they are about to start piano. So again, I'm thinking that if I had a, a life dream, it would still be, okay, Kimberly, get over yourself and take piano lessons. Yeah. And, and you know, the interesting thing, I mean, just, it just reminded me of something when, again, when my daughter was, I, their radio was on, she's in the back seat, and there is some Haydn playing. Yes. The radio. And all of a sudden this little kid pops over the back seat and says, is that classical or is it just corny? Oh, wow. That's interesting. You know, they, they know, I mean, they're, uh, yeah. Yes. That's wonderful. Yes. So, yes. so people should just really stick to your website to be able to do I some wonderful stick to the things. website. Well, once you're on the website, uh, you can get on the mailing list and you're, then you're oh, mailing the program. And, because and, if and people are, that. if people are planning trips. Exactly. And not only that, but one of the things that was really powerful about, um, building our audience, it turned out to our advantage during uh, COVID because we went ahead and did our festival, but they were all on Zooms. And how so, was that? So, oh, it was fantastic because we had people from all over the United States who listened. And Eric Zivian, who was a, a musical prodigy as a child, I mean, it's just fantastic, our artistic director, who plays the forte piano, he played uh, Beethoven's uh, 32 sonatas. Yeah. 
And uh, so they, you know, they've been listened to a huge, huge audience for that. And you can still go back online and you can, you can listen to all of those still. You know, it is an, an amazing blessing how realistic Zoom is, how lifelike it does feel like you're right there. Exactly. Exactly. Let me ask you something. Not only that, but you can also be right. If, sometimes if you're in a concert hall, what I love to do is I love to watch the hand motion. Me too. On every instrument. So what's really lovely when you're on Zoom, you can get that close, yes. that close up, yes. which you can't get in a concert. Well, I, I always try to sit on the side where I can look and watch the piano's hands because the other yes. side. Oh yes. my goodness! Yes. I, you know, okay. So you and I haven't yet another kind, but I wonder there are probably tons of people who feel that way. Uh, that's it's true. It's true. Want to so, watch the hands make the music? Yes, and we are definitely trying to figure out. Um, how to advance our audience participation and make, make it broader. And so we have the outside concerts. We have concerts in the back of Hannah. We have the kids concerts. Uh, we are having a, um, a presentation uh, out at La Luz, which will be lovely. And um, it, it sounds like it will be natural for you to expand this in so many ways, like more children's concerts and more. We hope, we, we hope so. We'll, we'll see. We'll oh, see. good. Uh, okay. Well, I, I need to ask you something now because you know yeah. that I am so largely about the power of letters, written gratitude, love, affection, and anything that's about the other guy. And yes. so if you were to write a love letter or a gratitude letter right now, to whom would it be? Oh, oh probably, probably my daughter. Who's, you know, I have, I have one child and just the fact that she just, oh gosh, no, there are just so many people, but uh that, me, that that's the thing there are so many people there are so many people because so many writing people. a love letter isn't a one-shot deal it's kind of a way of life if you have something positive to say write it down and mail it right right I actually think if I could write a letter to a deceased I would you write can. it you can. I can I actually would write it to my to my mother and you should yes and, I, and I should thank you thank you for that that's a good I don't mean to be so bossy but yes it's such a nice yes. thing to do and where would you mail that letter to your deceased mother oh I would where would I mail it um I would uh uh pro, I would probably mail it to all my sisters oh so, okay perfect so they, so yes. they could hear it but dear mom I, dear mom I'm writing this to you but I'm gonna send it to all of your daughters that's exactly right that's so exactly right. we so can my so mother was a, as she as she uh age she was quite a saver again we didn't have very much money and after my father passed away she went to work and she saved all of her money very diligently and after we were all off and gone to college and gone she started traveling which we were fascinated oh, with wonderful. and I those are kinds of things I never asked her very much about her travel but um so when she was um when she passed away she was cremated and we, all of her ashes were divided between the six of us and I carry her ashes on my travels and I, I sprinkle her around the world. Oh. Yes, because, because she loved to travel and that was great. Anyway, I would write a love letter to say all of the lessons that she had taught me. Yes. And, and more than that, but that I wish that we had had much more time to talk when, we, when I was an adult woman. Yes, yes. Because her life was difficult and complicated and um, when you're a young child, you only really respond probably to the difficulties and right. then are judgmental about them. Wonderful. What yes. about writing? What about sending one writing to your mother and sending one of them to your granddaughter? Oh, that's a good idea. And that's she can idea. open it when she's 18 or something. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I think oh, I have... my daughter, my the second letter would be to my daughter because, uh, Oh, I just, I owe her everything for ha for having her. I think mostly because I was, um, and we could say personal things. Yes, I was, sure. I was in a, I was in a uh, marriage that wasn't working uh -huh. and uh, it wasn't until I had my daughter that I realized I looked at her and I realized I needed to live a life of integrity and respect myself. And in order to do that, I needed to leave the relationship. So oh, that's a beautiful letter to your daughter. Yes, and well, she she knows it for sure. But, she knows, uh, she it. knows but, it. But to write it, uh, but. to write it, you're you're absolutely right. Because there's something about having it on paper in your handwriting, which means indelible ink, good paper. Oh, I yeah. have copies of letters that are a hundred years old, and you can read them like they were written yesterday. Oh, Janet, yeah. that is thank thank you for that suggestion. So, I, I so that. when she's an old woman, yes. herself, she can reread it. 
Yes. Because memory fades. You don't remember everything exact, but if it's written down, oh, you've got so much work to do. I'm so glad. I, I do. I do have a lot of work to do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. But, okay. but I do, uh, there, yes, there are a lot of things I'd like, information I'd like to pass on to her and all the things that the big absence of music in my life, playing an instrument was one of them. And that's why it's important to me for our, the grandchildren to uh, yes, play. And you're, part, and you're part of an important musical history. Yes. With well, what you're I, doing. Yes. Yes. So, you know, anything you write down is your own history in your own hand and your story is as worth telling as Romeo's and Juliet's. Why yeah. not? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I could also I could uh, uh, send you pictures of of my um, uh, myself and my five sisters in our. Oh, Scottish do that! Classroom. I'd like to see that. <laughs> so I have I have one other thought, sure. and you know this might be uh, just because I think like that. Writing a letter, you said you know it was Beethoven was the, maybe the first thing you writing a letter to Beethoven. Ooh. A love letter to Beethoven or Bach uh, for the, about the world that you opened up for me. And, Yes. And where do you send it? I would guess that there are places where there are archives. I was going to say, I would, I would bet that there are, and there are also museums. That that's right. And, and send it, you know, dear Ludwig, I'm oh. right next to you and I'm going to send it to her, but I want you to know how I feel. You should do it. Fantastic. You know what else I was thinking? That is also, I'm always thinking in terms of my board and in terms of expanding. Yes, the of festival. course, of course. That would be a great, I could send that out on the website to, to for people to read. Oh, that would be oh, wonderful. That would be a wonderful. really good idea, yes. yes. So um, let me ask you a question. Have you, how did you become aware of the Valley of the Moon Music Festival? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. You know, it I, I was something I knew about vaguely, but I, I knew you and Simon from a long time ago and somehow some conversation with somebody that you were involved with this Valley of the Moon music festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, I'm, I just want to get a hold of my old friend, Kimberly Black oh, Ratner, yes. and, you know, do this and let more people know about it. Yes. Yeah. Well, th that's one of the things I just want to figure out in terms of the circles of classical music, how, how we continue to get the word out, because unless you I are, yes. who thinks that, that you, that you don't follow classical music, even if you saw an advertisement, you wouldn't necessarily go. So right. it's that wanting to reach out to someone's heart. You know, I think it's things like this because we live in miraculous times. Yes. Where that's you true. can do this yes. and send it everywhere you can think, you know, just, let it be known at other people's newsletters. Yes. Everywhere you can and see what happens. Yes. Okay. Well, oh, thank you for doing this with me. We have a lot more to talk about. So we, we um, do. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I just am so touched by your upbringing and all that you've done that I didn't know wow. about and that I would like to. So let's just thank get you. together. We, so. we, have, we have more. I, I guarantee you that every single one of your guests has a lot more to talk about. No. <laughs> No. That's, you, know, you know something, Kimberly, every, everybody has what to talk about. And if it's done, you know, with joy and honesty and candor, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. I yes. think so too. I do. Okay. okay. Thank you, dear. Right. I will, we'll, we'll be in touch. And I want to just thank you for doing this with me. You just. More, more than welcome. I'm, and I just want to say that I am delighted to now be exposed to love letters because I've gone through and listened to a couple and they are so meaningful and touching. So well, I think you. so too. And you're such a feeling person yeah. that yours would be just great. Okay. Yes. Let me okay. know how, let me know. I mean, you know, not mine to be busybody about, but I'd like to know how people respond if you ever feel like sharing that. Good. Okay. And meanwhile, thank you for doing this with me. I learned a lot today. Oh, thank you. So have I. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Okay. Mwah. Goodbye. Bye.